Well, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Our God is so beautiful, and he's in love with you, right? So you might be going through life going, I just uh, messed up. I'm a mess up. I'm no good. I failed and failed and failed and failed, and I don't know if I can go back to him. This is when you need to go to him. This is when, you, when you're broken, when you're at the end of yourself, when you're like, nothing is right, when my heart is shattered, when, my, when darkness surrounds me when when loss is all around me and you're like well, well I thought I had but I don't have and I thought I could but I cannot this is when you come to God because he loves you and no matter what situation you might find yourself in he is inviting you to come to him to carry you to love you to honor you to pick you up where else you gonna go you're gonna go to the news you're gonna go to NFL you're gonna go to NBA you're gonna go to hockey ain't nobody gonna help you no God is gonna help you that's why we come to God, loved one, because he loves you. And it's going to protect you. Now, we're studying in 1 Samuel, and we're studying the first king of Israel. Now, he should have quit. He should have quit 15 years ago. He should have said, you know what, uh, the, the Lord is stripping me. Uh, I, I don't even want to hear him. I, I have nothing to do with him. I'm a, rebel a rebellious child. And, and I, this is King Saul. He should have quit because when he tore Samuel's robe, he uh, Samuel turned around and said, the kingdom is torn from you. He should have quit. Some people got to know in, in leadership position when to quit, when to get out. And obviously a lot of people don't know in leadership positions when to get out. Saul's one of them. He did not know. So... Uh, we're going to find him in chapter 28, right? In chapter 27, we saw David just like, I'm done. 10 years plus of running and running and running and running from cave to cave to cave. He wasn't going from Hilton to Hilton, from Hilton to another Hilton. He wasn't, he was going from cave to cave. Yeah, it was a hard life. It wasn't one or two, three chapters. It was over 10 years. And David was like exhausted. He's like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And so he, he ran to the Philistine land and he shouldn't have done that. He'd stayed there for 16 months. Not one time during that 16 months did David uh, produce a psalm. And that's what happens when we, you and I, run away from God. We, we can't hear him. And so David couldn't hear him. He was looting. He was taking out all the Philistine lands in the south. He was lying to King Achish of Gath. He's one of the Philistine kings and leaders. And he was like, yeah, I'm looting my people Israel. No, he wasn't. But he was lying and he was getting all this jewelry and clothing. And, all, and he was killing all the people. David was in a dark place here. He really was. But even darker, Saul. My. Because David, at the end of the day, was a man after God's own heart. Saul, he's like, oh, forget you, God. I know I got what I got. I got my kingship. I don't need you. Boy, was he mistaken. And so we catch Saul here in chapter 28. It says, and it came to pass in those days, 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. So this is not like, oh, this is a brand new war. This, this is for generations to generations. I mean, we're talking about 1000 BC. We're talking all the way to today where you have a war in Israel versus the Gaza Strip and, and wh whether it's the Houthis from Yemen or Hezbollah from Lebanon. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's everywhere from the Gaza Strip. It's everywhere. It's, it's, it was there before today. And people are like, it's a new war. It's not a new war. It started way back then. The Philistines were fighting against Israel. And Achish said to David. Now, David is hanging out with Achish the king. Uh, in the Philistine land. Shouldn't be there, but he is. And know you are assuredly that you shall go out with me to battle, you and your men. So Achish is telling David, since you've been with me for 16 months, you are going to... Go with me and your 600 soldiers. You are going to fight with me against Israel. What does David say? In verse 2, David said to Achish, Surely you shall know that your servant, what your servant can do. <clears throat> David, he is, you are, he is not your master and you are not his servant. You are the servant of the living God. This is what, when you and I don't pray 
and make a decision. We get into trouble, and David here was in trouble, but he's calling Achish a Philistine king, his master, and he's calling himself the servant. He's the one that took out Goliath from Gath. We're in the same area. David's hanging out in Ziglag, a little south of Gath. And, but he is, that's the same place where Goliath came from. A nine foot nine giant. And he slew him in, in chapter 17. And now he's saying, I'll go with you. I'll go and slay the Israelites, my own people. And Achish said to David, therefore will I make you keeper of my head forever. That means you're my bodyguard. You're my secret service. Wherever I go, you're going to protect me and you're going to make sure I ain't get no bullet in my head. And so uh, he's now made him the bodyguard forever, he says. And, and in verse 3, we read something that we're like, well, this is confusing. And Samuel was dead and all Israel had lamented him and buried him. Well, it's very important that he gives us that Samuel was dead because, I mean, in, I think it was in chapter 25, right? And Samuel died in chapter 25. So now we're in chapter 28, and you're like, why is he telling us again? And wh why did all the people mourn? Of course, he was a great prophet. Uh, we saw him when he was a little kid with Hannah, had him as a little baby, and he dedicated him to the temple where Eli took care of him, right? And so Samuel was dead. Now, he's saying this on purpose, because Samuel, believe it or not, is going to come up in this chapter, even though he's dead. And um, so, and, and all of Israel lamented and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards um, uh, out of the land. So he, Saul, bravo. So this says that even if you're wicked and wrong and rebellious, you can still do right. So if somebody does right, it's like a song, you know, they're like, um, talk about all kinds of immorality and all kinds of darkness and all kinds of suicide and all kinds of hatred. Yet they, they have the word in there, God, bless uh, God is good, something like that. And people are like, it's a Christian song. It's a Christian. It's not a Christian song. If it had sexual immorality and darkness and evil and demonic forces that wrote the lyrics and then they said God in it and, and Christians and Christ followers are like, it's, it's a good song. It is not. Or a leader who's just dirty, nasty, and does does 99 things wrong, and one thing good, and they're like, he's so good. He's such a good leader. No, he's not. It's just to seduce you or me and captivate you and me. So this bad king did something good. Bravo. Bravo, Saul. So he got rid of uh, all the familiar spirits and the wizards. And I remember um, one time, one of my patients gave me about, y'all not going to believe it, 20 blue jeans. Okay. And the blue jeans each cost anywhere from $300 to $500, even more, $750 each. But it had a sign on it. And I love those jeans. And it had a sign on it. And, and I, I was wearing the jeans. I, I mean, you'd go to the airport. People will look at that. Like, oh, nice jeans. Not kidding you. And the Holy Spirit said, you got to get rid of the jeans. And I'm like, I, you're talking to me? Yeah, you got to get rid of them jeans. I'm like, for why? What reason? He said, you know exactly what reason. Hmm. So literally... The Spirit of God said, get rid of him. Loved one, there are Christians who read horoscopes, if not daily, once a week. And they be talking about, what's your sign? Hmm? My sign is Jesus. What's your sign? Okay, so they horoscopes, tarot cards, Ouija boards. And you're like, but, but I, I, I swear, it talked to me. Yes, it talked to you, but it wasn't from God. And if you're playing like that, Ouija boards, palm readers, 
Let me see your palm. Let me read. Or some of my Armenian peoples do this. They get coffee. They were like, like that. And then they're like, oh, wouldn't you finish it? Let me see your cup. Turn it over and then turn it. And I'm going to read. If you are a Christ follower, Ouija boards, tarot cards, palm readers, all this coffee reading stuff, it's a no-no. And you're like, Dr. Sam, that's, that's not horoscopes. It, it helps me. No, it don't help you. If it's helping you, it's a demonic force trying to trap you, seduce you, and, and maim you. Because you and I open up a door and give Satan a foothold on us. And then you'd be wondering, why is my right life so rotten? Help me. Uh, no, uh, help me help you, or let me help you, and tell you if you got anything like that. Go, go and uh, go in your house. You know, between um, Connect Four, you know, you might have Connect Four at your house. That's an old game, or Monopoly. That's an old game and a new game. It's always a Monopoly is always up there, and right in between them, you might find a Ouija board. You get rid of that. You get you toss it out. Don't give it to no Salvation Army. You don't need to c curse somebody else. You get rid of it. Garbage. Hmm? Whenever your garbage is picked up, just go ahead and throw it in the garbage. All right? Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm here to help you. And so, uh, this is what he, he's gotten rid of all these wizards. Bravo. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came to, and pitched in Shunem. And, and Saul gathered all the Israelites together and they pitched in Gilboa. And you're like, uh, I don't know where it is. Our trusted little map. Oh, one day we'll get better. And one day we'll have flashing computers things. But today, this is what we got. All right, kids, beautiful peoples. Here is the Sea of Galilee. Here's the Jordan River coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down. Go up, Dead Sea. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the land of Israel. And the farther you get out to the west, and even today in Gaza Strip, um, it's it's uh, where the Philistines were, huh? Right there. And then here is where uh, Gath was, where uh, Goliath came from. And, by the way, where King Akesh was. And uh, they think Ziglag, they're not certain, but it's south of that. And they're going all the way up here to the land of Jezreel. And that land, loved one, is exactly where Megiddo is. And that land is exactly where you're going to have Armageddon start, okay? Here on the edge, right up here, if you see this, this is where Mount Carmel is, where Elijah killed, Elijah killed 450 prophets of Baal. And here is where Shunem is, Shunem. And here is where Gilboa is, where Mount Gilboa is. So there, there is a river that separates them and they're getting ready to fight. So they're way up in the north. You know, you, you would think their fighting would be in the south, but they went all the way up into the north to, to, do, to do their warfare. Okay, that's by the way, Mount Gilboa is at the foot of it, is where Gideon in chapter 6 and 7 of Judges got rid of 32,000 of his soldiers and tapered them down to 300. You didn't know that, huh? That's exactly where that happened in Mount Gilboa. So that's where we are. We're in the northern, I was about to say we're in northern California. But we're not. We're here in Southern California. But these peoples are fighting in Northern Israel. Okay? Cool. Now, so you, I wanted you to get a hold of where we are. And in verse 5, it says, And Saul saw the host of the Philistines. He was afraid. And his heart greatly trembled. <laughs> this is the first time... I wonder if he went into atrial fibrillation because it says his heart greatly trembled. Now, I don't think he went into the ventricular tachycardia because somebody had to get the paddles and shock that boy out of his death and bring him back to life. But I don't think so. I don't think it was VTAC. I think maybe he was having palpitations, premature atrial contractions or premature ventricular contractions. He was having some kind of contractions because it says his heart greatly trembled. Sounds like atrial fib to me. All right, so 
uh, he was afraid. Now, this is in contrast of chapter 11. Y'all remember chapter 11? Not really, huh? Me neither. That's why we're going to go back there, okay? Chapter 11, uh, verse 6, somewhere around there. Chapter 11, and, and the Spirit of God came upon, upon Saul when he heard these tidings, and his anger was greatly... You remember there was this dude named Nahash, he was like Satan. He was of the uh, Ammonites. He came up and he encamped uh, against Jabez Gilead, and he told them that, you know, I'm going to give you certain days, I'm going to take out your right eye, and, and you if you took out somebody's right eye... Uh, you, you couldn't fight because they, they had to have a shield, uh, and then, uh, and then when one hand they had a sword, but they couldn't see their enemy well because one eye was out. So you needed a good peripheral vision. So this man, Nahash, said, I'm going to take out your eye. And they begged the people of Jabesh Gilead, bathed them and said, give us some seven days so that we may consider your proposition. Really? Okay, and so Saul heard about it. And he goes, no, ain't nobody going to take out nobody's eye. I'm going to go against this Jabesh. I'm going to go to Jabesh Gilead. I'm going to go to Nahash. I'm going to take him out and all his people out because they're not going to do this to Israel. I'm not going to have it. And the Spirit of God fell upon Saul. First Samuel chapter 11, verse 6. When he heard these tidings and his anger was kindled greatly. Watch this in, in chapter 28. And his heart greatly trembled. Verses chapter 11. And, and it said, and his anger was kindled greatly versus his heart greatly trembled. Oh my goodness. What a contrast when you walk with the Lord and you talk with the Lord and you love the Lord and you set yourself up to a place where I am separated unto God. Your anger, not vile anger, not the anger when you and I get agitated when somebody cuts in front of us and we honk the horn. I'm angry at you. That was my lane. Not that kind of anger. But the anger of the Spirit of the Lord to know right from wrong, to know light from darkness, and to know sweet from sour and not backwards. That kind of anger. And to do the work of the Lord. And to follow him with all your heart and might and soul. That's where he was at the beginning when he was humble. But pride has a way of breaking down somebody's morality. To think I can do whatever I want to do. I can cheat taxpayers, I can steal from the people who are below me, and I can manipulate the system in such a way where I can get rich, and I can get power, and I can go up top, and I can run and ride all over everybody's back. Oh, it's not only back then. It's today. Mm -hmm. It's today. That is somebody who follows God to know right from wrong and to take out the wrong and to tell the wrong, you will not stand because this ground is holy. Versus when Saul is in the wrong and rebellious and his kingdom is already torn from him and he in his crazy state still stays there because in his arrogance he feels like he deserves it. Saul. And he knows no right or wrong, or he knows the right and refuses to do the right. Remember in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, when he was told to take out the Amalekites, and he said, I did it. And Samuel said, no, you didn't. This sheep that I'm hearing, they're bleeding. They're, they're, I hear them, and, and you, do, you did wrong. And, and then you kept the king. You did wrong. And he's like, I didn't do it. The men did it. No, you did wrong. And, and when Samuel told him the kingdom was stripped, he, he took a hold of Samuel's robe. We'll talk about that later. In rebelliousness, in the darkness, 
Saul was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. Mm. Loved ones, you're going to have to figure this out. If you're running around life fearing, scared, uh, what's the next virus? What's the next bacteria? What's the next fungus? What's the next news? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen? If you're running around like that, I'm going to ask you, where are you living? Because you either live in the spirit of the living God or you live in fear and rebelliousness because rebelliousness and disobedience translates into fear while obedience and sanctification translates into courage. And I ain't trying to beat nobody down. I'm just trying to wake the sleepy church of America up and the world. Yes, it's time to wake up. It's time, it's time to make a decision because, I mean, we can go to Leviticus and you're like, what, Leviticus? Yeah. We can go to Leviticus. We can go to chapter 9. I believe it's in chapter 9. I know it's in 11. But let's go to chapter 9. Leviticus chapter 9. And it says... Where is it at? Here we go. Leviticus. And in fact, I'm going to go... Oh, yes. Uh, actually, 10.10. 10. Uh, Leviticus 10.10. 10. It says... And that you may put a difference between the holy and the unholy... And between the unclean and the clean. God is asking. That's God talking. He wants you and me to say separate holy versus unholy. He wants you and me to separate between the unclean and clean. And, and in, in Leviticus 11.44, I believe it's 44. He says, for I am the Lord your God. And you shall therefore sanctify, separate yourselves. And you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So he was talking about creeping things, but for anything in life, God is holy. He wants you to be holy. And as you walk in his holiness, believe me, there will be no fear. There will be no angst. There will be no anxiety. And depression has to die Die in the name of Jesus. Yeah? Okay, in First Peter, we'll go, uh, we'll go to First Peter. I, I mean, you're like, well, I need help. It's only a prayer away. Because, you know, uh, in chapter 6 of Matthew, uh, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You got help. Ephesians chapter 6, you got help. You got the helmet of salvation. You got the breastplate of righteousness. You got the shield of faith. You got the sword, the Bible. Ah, no wonder people are scared because they don't have the sword, the Bible. The Bible is like an unknown thing. It sits on the shelf and it gets done. Ah, that's why Christ followers are afraid. That's why Christ followers acting like the world. Come on, Christian. It's time for you to wake up. It's time for me to wake up. Let's go. Let's go with this. Let's go with the armor God has given us. Let's go with the armor God gave to you and me. So... In 1 Timothy, or I think it's in 2 Timothy, actually. Let's go there. 2 Timothy 1, 7. 2 Timothy. 1 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. He didn't give you no spirit of fear. You don't need to be afraid right now, loved one. You can say, fear, get out of me in the name of Jesus. You're a demonic force. I'm not going to accept you. What did God give you when you and I sanctify ourselves? When we come to God and say, I'm right. I'm riding with holy. That's it. No more. Not a holy roller where like, oh, you're wrong and she's wrong and I can't stand them and they're not as perfect as I am. No, no, no. Not that kind of holy. Holy in reverence coming before God and saying, you are holy and I know your blood, the son, your son's blood 
on the cross makes me holy and I am so in awe of it and I am so humbled by it and I want to come to you and honor you all the days of my life. That kind of holy. Yes, that kind of holy. That's the way we want to roll. Not judging people. Not, not, you're bad. Now, you can judge between right and wrong because you got to. But you and I got to f get rid of fear because that's ungodly. But God has not given you a spirit of fear like uh, Saul. He gave you the spirit of power. And of love. And a sound mind. See, when you got the sound mind, you got peace. And when you got the sound mind, you ain't got no fear. And when you got the sound mind, you got courage. And when you got the sound mind, you be like David versus Goliath. You come against me with your sword and spear and your nasty words. But I come to you and, and against you in the name of God Most High. That, that's power. That's what God gives to you and me. Power, not fear. Love, not hate. And a sound mind that can withstand any pressure that this world and your family or your colleagues or your professors or your co-workers are placing on you. The sound mind says, I fly like the eagles. And I soar high in the name of my God. And no Philistine, no Amalekite, no Amorite, no Jebusite, no nobody is going to take me down because I fly in the name of Jesus Christ. In verse 6 it says, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, what happened? Well, We'll just have to tune in next time to find out what happened when he inquired of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, loved ones. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't know him as your personal Savior, it's time, it's time, it's time. It's time to come to him and say, uh, I'm acting like Saul. I'm acting scared. I'm acting rebellious. I had no idea that I was born in sin even. I didn't even know what sin was because they don't talk about it in church. Sin is our DNA, spiritual DNA, that is dark and is against God and is not reconciled with God. But the blood of Jesus is the antidote that takes that sin completely out, yesterday's, today's, and tomorrow's sin. It takes it completely out and reconciles us to God through the Son of the Son, Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how it works. Come to him as you are, loved ones. Say, uh, I'm changing my DNA today. I'm getting God's DNA in me. And I'm going to soar like the eagles. And I will not have a spirit of fear or damnation. I will have a, a, a spirit of salvation and redemption. A spirit of power and love. And a spirit of sound mind. That's what Jesus is here to give to you today. Take it and let's get rid of the unholy ground and let's come to him sanctified, separated, his children, bringing him glory. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Well, loved ones, it's time. It's about 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and we're going on CTN right now on the Southwest Florida Channel. Talk about, talk about revelation. I hope you watch it. God bless you and God keep you. God shine his face upon you. I love you all. Be well. Bye-bye.